update 2 on Cyclone Megan as it is rapidly intensifying right now in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Now a high-end calorie 1, yes high-end, as it pushes off towards the south very, very slowly. And it has stalled in the last 12 to 24 hours as it continues to push off towards the south. And the heavy rainfall threat is only just beginning for portions of the coastline. Right now it's got winds of 90 miles per hour and a pressure of 970 millibars. But look at that movement south southwest at one miles per hour and we have pushed into ticos code orange as a result of the rainfall threat and the upgrade in the intensity forecast and it is now looking almost certain that this one will peak as a category two maybe even getting up towards category three on the top of the scale prior to landfall since what the storm is located right now 14.8 degrees south 137.3 degrees east it located 56 miles from north island and closing 68 from west both of those are part of the uh, island pain to the top of the storm 103 from Maria Island, 109 from Barolula, and 463 from Darwin. In kilometers, respectively, those are 90, 110, 165, 175, and 745. We are expected to see cyclone force winds uh, impact the coastline to the, near the landfall area pretty imminently. In fact, they are probably already occurring right now, as the wind field is mainly on the northern side of the storm right now. Um, so, albeit there are still some impacts on the coastline that the storm is moving away from, but those will cease over the next few hours. Cyclone warnings right now extend from Aldangula, Guta Island, and Northern Territory to, to Mornington Island in Queensland, including Borolula, but not including Dunkirk and Mornington Island. The cyclone watch area is from Mornington Island in Queensland, as well as a distant part of the Carpentaria Desert inland to Robinson River in the Northern Territory. So you know what the primary hazards are with this storm right now? We remain, uh, our primary hazard remain to be, of course, the insane rainfall that with this storm right now, albeit the population under risk is not too much. Albeit, we are up to 400 to 500 millimeters of rain likely near and just west of where the center comes ashore. And those will extend a few um, a few days inland as well, uh, with the sun of pushing inland as well. With the uh, the strong winds that we're seeing right now with this storm pitching up towards Calorie 2 now on this upper Simpson scale, we are expecting that the uh, that wind gusts will, will potentially exceed 115 miles per hour in the landfall area, which those kind of winds are capable of causing severe to catastrophic damage. And the residents are strongly urged to prepare accordingly. Time is running out to prepare, though. Here's where the storm is located right now. You can see it in the Gulf of Carpentaria. So, as our latest forecast say, very slow movement initially. Uh, then it picks up pace as it goes into land, picking as a high end category 2. Could get to category 3 briefly. We'll have to wait and see on that, though. Our latest forecast is calling for a peak of 110 miles per hour. And then it weakens as it pushes inland and uh, will we'll curve off towards the west northwest here. Almost gets back over, almost gets back over wolf and water, but ends up dissipating as we get towards day five. No threat to the city of Darwin, though. Thankfully, you can see that uh, city up there on the other side of the forecast cone on the DCWC's forecast map, predicting a peak intensity of 105 miles per hour as it comes into land. There uh, stalls a little bit in terms of the intensification forecast due to increasing wind shear, which you'll see just how high it'll get on the Joint Typhoon Warning Centers um, on the REM plot, and that's a plot here in just a few minutes. But uh, that is a harbinger to the storm that could be uh, seen in the immediate future, as wind shear is actually already on the rise, albeit very, very slowly. Here what we're seeing right now for the latest density forecast, and why we've gone 90 miles per hour, ADT and SATCON pretty solidly estimating winds of uh, 90 miles per hour. AMSU earlier was down at 80 to 85, but that was an earlier pass, and TGNVC are hopelessly behind at uh, still at 75 miles per hour. Although the 0Z ATCF is due to update, and I imagine the pipe will be up probably to winds up 85 miles per hour, and uh, there'll be, of course, increase in that intensity estimate later down the line as well as it goes into land. So here's what the latest one type warning center forecast cone says, or uh, the latest CFS model run, I should say. Um, peaks it as a category one, maybe even a category two, as it pushes into land there. Um, you can see that it goes a little bit farther off towards the south than what the one that the uh, WC is forecasting, but you can see there that brief research and right at day five as it gets up and it tries to get up towards open water, uh, but doesn't end up making it there, of course, um, due to the wind, wind shear and land interaction that we're going to be seeing with this storm. It's probably not going to make it back over open waters, but the rainfall there is going to be the main story with this. Of course, 500 millimeters up to that and be even a little bit exceeding that is what our latest forecast is. Um, just just near where the storm makes landfall and just to the west. Of course, um, that rainfall threat could lead to some severe flooding issues of the uh, inland low-lying areas, given that there isn't really a whole lot of mountainous regions in these areas that the storm is coming into. See what sister are seeing right now, they continue to increase up towards 30 degrees Celsius, 
maybe even exceeding that as it comes to the coastline here. 32 degrees Celsius even, um, potentially. Uh, so sea temperature, temperature continue to increase as the storm goes into land. And uh, that could be a, 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 a potential offset to the wind shear as it comes into land. So maybe we'll see this storm intensify up to a peak intensity and then maintain it as it comes into land. The observation observations map aren't really suggesting too much here. You can see that they've got a pressure of, of in the low 1000s uh, just to the northwest of the center of circulation, but the storm's core is just far too small to, for them, for that station to really record anything too significantly. So we're not really looking for any stations, unfortunately, of any significance to record any observations, unfortunately. Um, so we'll have to wait and see um, what that station says to the north of the center as it continues to pull away. Maybe it'll get something in an outer band. We'll have to wait and see on that, though. We'll be monitoring it very closely. So you know what the RAM diagnostic plot is saying right now, the JWC forecast track is, I think it's, it's the most accurate one right now. You can see that it's that gray line, as it, as it says uh, right now. Once it makes landfall, that is, I think the Bureau of Meteorology has a track right up to landfall is the most accurate, but half that JWC is, of course. It should be off in the blue, GFS in the red, uh, going much farther off towards the south, so maybe some further adjustments is needed. But look at that landfall location, it has to be significantly farther off towards the southeast than the uh, JWC has it. Intensification trend GFS and HWRF are hopelessly behind, has to be said. Um, so JWC is right on the money with this, I think, again, in terms of the intensification trend. We'll have to wait and see how strong the storm gets, though. It's got 24 to 56 hours before it makes landfall, so despite the proximity of the land, it's got some time to work with it. Wind shear has risen a little bit. It's got up to 15 knots, but uh, will those seats of temperatures offset that wind shear? Amount remains to be seen. It looks to be like that it's going to do it over the next 20, 12 to 24 hours. Relative humidity is going to decrease um, pretty much from here on out, so that might offset a little bit of the um, of these temperatures as well. And uh, it's a very complicated forecast in terms of intensity, um, but the but the general story is this storm is going to intensify over the next 12 to 24 hours. How strong does it get remains to be seen, but our forecast is 110 miles per hour. See what we're looking like on the uh, satellite imagery right now. You can see that the, the storm is blowing up very, very cold amounts of cloud tops, leading to a very high rainfall threat. And underneath that uh, cold cloud tops, believe it or not, it looks a, a bit disorganized in terms of the satellite imagery. Um, if we were looking at a high end priority one, but believe it or not, under there is a, a, a pretty severe core forming, believe it or not, based on radar imagery, um, indicating that a core is indeed forming or has already actually formed. And um, it's going to to ramp up quite quickly as it pushes off towards the south-southwest very slowly. Um, only at one mile per hour movement right now. But we're continuing to monitor this storm very closely. Um, you can see those outer bands starting to push on towards the coastline of the landfall area. And they've probably been getting some heavy rainfall. Um, it's going to be a long, a long 48 hours for these patches of the coastline. As the storm makes landfall over the next 12 to 24 hours. Or should I say beyond that even. Heavy rainfall threat continues, and we'll continue to monitor this storm very closely. Uh, Drew Atlant is also getting the main rainfall threat of this storm right now, reporting a uh, rain in excess of two inches per hour potentially. Over there, I've been noticing that over the last 12 to 24 hours. So they, they've they're getting the book of the rainfall threat, and we'll have further updates on the storm as it makes landfall over the next 36 hours. And if you are in the landfall area, stay safe, and I hope that you prepared adequately for this dangerous tropical cyclone.